In this study of Spotlight on the Word, we continue our study of the books of history and we'll be focusing on the books of First and Second Kings. First and Second Kings are really all about change and upheaval. Change and upheaval. And there are a couple of themes that are interwoven through First and Second Kings. One has to do with the kings of Israel and God's evaluation of them. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs 14 and verse 34. And really, it's God's evaluation of a leader that really counts, not popularity polls. And then secondly, you have the ministry of prophets. Prophets were men who spoke for God to the people. Because of that, they were often uh, maligned and persecuted. They spoke for God to people. The priest went to God on behalf of the people, but the prophet would go to people on behalf of God. And that's why the prophets were often an unpopular lot. When we look at 1 Kings, we will see Israel at its height in power and glory under Solomon. But when we get to the book of 2 Kings and get to the conclusion of the book, you'll see Judah marching off in chains to Babylon. When we look at 1 Kings, we will see the temple being built, arrayed with great glory and with great fanfare. When we look at the book of 2 Kings, we will see the temple being destroyed by the Babylonians. So when we look at these two books, although they are two books in our Bibles, 1st and 2nd Kings, they really should be treated as one, and originally they were, but they deal with a massive amount of time. The time frame is about 385 years from the beginning of Solomon's reign to the time the kingdom divided into north and south, and then to the time that the northern kingdom went into captivity, 2 Kings chapter 17, which would be about 722 B.C., to the Assyrians, and then the southern kingdom, Judah, would go into captivity to Babylon some 135 years later in 586 B.C. Now there's a lot of dates and a lot of names that are somewhat odd and difficult to keep in mind, but do remember this. The idea is God can be removed he can be rejected, rather, but he cannot be removed. God can be rejected by a country and its leaders, but he cannot be removed. In the words of Revelation 19 and verse 6, The Lord God omnipotent reigns. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 17, 14. Revelation 19 and verse 16. John was writing to a persecuted church in the book of Revelation through the Holy Spirit, and he reminds them that God is king, that God is sovereign. The Lord of glory, God is. Psalm 24 and verse 10. He is the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. And so this needs to be a point that you'll mark down in your mind and in your Bibles that while God may be rejected, he cannot be removed. He is still the king. And as we look at First and Second Kings, another thing that we're going to notice is this that really the success of a nation depends upon its faithfulness to God and obeying His will. It depends upon a nation's faithfulness to God and the obedience of the people to His will. Even in 1 Kings chapter 9, this is discussed. And how that you were to follow in the ways of your father David and to be a man of integrity and to walk with uprightness. This is what Solomon was admonished to do. Well, let me give you the key words of First and Second Kings and then an outline of these two books together. The key word of 1 Kings is the word division. 
division. It is a time of change and political upheaval. The word to remember is division. And then when we look at the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings, the key word to remember is the word conquest. Conquest. Both of those nations, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, once part of the great united kingdom, both go into captivity in the book of 2 Kings. Now, here is an outline for the book that might be helpful. First and Second Kings can be uh, outlined as follows, just with three points. In the first place, the United Kingdom, First Kings chapters 1 through 11. First Kings chapters 1 through 11. Then, First Kings chapter 12 to the end of the book, chapter 22, the divided kingdom. The divided kingdom. And then 2 Kings, with its 25 chapters, can all be summarized in this heading. The kingdom taken. The kingdom taken. Or the kingdom overran. The northern and southern kingdoms meet their demise to the Assyrians and to the Babylonians. So what we have is the kingdom united, the kingdom divided, the kingdom conquered or overrun in the book of 2 Kings. Well, in the time that we have left, let's look at some important passages from these two books, recognizing that it's going to be very difficult to take almost four year, 400 years of history and boil things down as well as one might like. But let's look at 1 Kings. In 1 Kings chapters 1 through 11, the primary character is obviously Solomon. Solomon. And in the first three chapters of 1 Kings, Solomon's wisdom is dealt with. How would you like to be given a blank check by God? Basically, that's what happened in the life of Solomon. God said to Solomon, because of the type of man you are, I will give you any blessing, any gift you desire. He could have asked for a lot of money. He could have asked for power, but he asked for wisdom. And that's the theme of these first three chapters. He asked for the ability to discern, to scrutinize, to evaluate things so that he would not only know what was right from what was wrong, but he would also know what was best as opposed to merely what is good. Philippians 1 verses 9 through 11. What a great thing Solomon asked for. And as a result, God also gave him great wealth. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapters 4 through 10. But right in the middle of this section, especially 1 Kings chapters 5 through 8, we read of Solomon's work on the temple. What an opportunity, what a great blessing it must have been for Solomon to build the temple where God would be worshipped and praised. His father David had contributed immensely to the materials that would be utilized for it, but was not allowed by God to build the temple because he was a man of war. Solomon is allowed this blessing and privilege of building this magnificent temple to the glory and honor of God. One of the great prayers in the Old Testament is found in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple. And Solomon is aware that the temple cannot hold God in all of his glory. That sounds strikingly like Paul in Acts 17 verse 24. God cannot be contained with houses, temples made with hands. And yet Solomon knew that this was what God wanted and this was a magnificent place where God could be worshipped and praised. But when you look at 1 Kings chapters 1 through 11, another thing you're going to see is the wickedness of Solomon. The wickedness of Solomon. The wisdom and wealth, the half has not been told, so said the Queen of Sheba. In 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 7. But you look here at this passage in 1 Kings 11. And it becomes obvious that Solomon, as wise as he was, was a man of wickedness. 
He loved many foreign women, and these foreign women turned his hearts away, his heart away from God. Think about that. The strongest man, as far as we know, to ever live was Solomon, and he had a weakness as it concerns sexual sin. Judges chapters 13 through 16. David was a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14. And yet he was guilty of sexual sin in 2 Samuel chapter 11 with Bathsheba. And now here is Solomon, this man of incomparable wisdom and wealth. And his downfall is sexual sin. Surely there's something that we can learn from that. If strong men like Samson, if good-hearted people like David, and wise and wealthy people like Solomon could fall prey to sexual temptation, how alert do we need to be about it today? What a terrible thing sexual sin is because it can devastate a marriage, a family, a church, and when it becomes commonplace, as it has in so many countries today, it can ruin nations. It can help ruin nations. As you keep looking at 1 Kings, notice chapter 12. Because in many ways, 1 Kings chapter 12 is the key chapter in this book. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. But Rehoboam is not very wise. He is going to make things very difficult for God's people. And as a result, a, a break occurs, a division occurs, where ten tribes called the northern tribes align themselves with a military leader by the name of Jeroboam, and the two tribes align themselves, Judah and Benjamin, with Rehoboam. What happens is significant in 1 Kings chapter 12. Because in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 28 through the end of the chapter, Jeroboam does something that is so ungodly and wicked that he immediately leads the northern kingdom astray. He says it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem and worship. So two golden calves are constructed. One is placed in Dan, the other is placed at Bethel. And what happens is this, Jeroboam changes the object of worship, the place of worship, the priesthood for worship, and the time of worship. He did that for which there was simply no authority, and he, cre he, he, he created terrible sins. He was in instigating terrible sins among the northern kingdom, the people of that kingdom. When we stop and think about it today, it is so crucial that we worship God in spirit with the proper attitude, John 4, 24, and that we worship him in truth according to his divine authority. That's what John 4 and verse 24 would indicate, and this comes from the lips of our Lord himself. It is difficult to think that one will be right with God who is wrong on the subject, the theme of worship. And it is repeatedly said of Jeroboam through the rest of the Old Testament, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. A polluted, watered-down, unbiblical, unauthorized form of worship does not honor God, even if it gives some people an emotional high at the time. As we keep looking at 1 Kings chapter, uh, at the book of 1 Kings, notice 1 Kings chapter 13. There we read of a young prophet known simply as the man of God out of Judah. He goes to Jeroboam, the king of the northern kingdom, and he talks to him and he delivers a firm message from God regarding what is going on. On his way back, he had been told not to stop, but an older prophet says, God spoke to me, and God told me that you could come in and have supper with me, 
and enjoy some refreshment, some time with me, fellowship, if you will. And the man of God out of Judah, the young prophet, does just that. And there in that older prophet's home, God speaks through the prophet and says, the older prophet, and says to the young man, you have not done my will. And you are going to die as a result of disobedience. Here's something to think about. A lion brought about the death of that man of God out of Judah, that younger prophet. And in a way, you look at 1 Kings 13, and it seems to be so harsh, so hard. But what the passage does is remind us about the possibility of believing a lie. There are those who suppress the truth. So says Romans 1 and verse 18. There are those who turn the truth of God into a lie. So says Romans 1 and verse 25. There are those who do not obey the truth. Romans chapter 2 and verse 8. And here is this young man, this young prophet, the man of God out of Judah, who loses his life because he believes a lie. How important it is for us to buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23 and verse 23. It is important for us to love and to believe the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 10 through 12. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8 and verse 32. It is good to read a book like 1 Kings and a chapter like 1 Kings 13 because it reminds us of the possibility of sincerely believing a lie and none of us want to be guilty of that. In 1 Kings chapter 14, Jeroboam sends his wife to a prophet by the name of Abijah because their son is sick, sick almost to the point of death. And so Jeroboam sends his wife, and she goes with a disguise. She goes with some, some gifts, some cakes, some loaves of, loaves of bread. She comes with a jar of honey, not too much, not too little, just the right amount of gifts. And she comes bearing these gifts and comes to the prophet Abijah's home. The Bible indicates in this chapter that Abijah was very uh, dim in his vision. He didn't have good eyesight, but there was nothing wrong with his hearing. God had spoken to him, and God had let him know that the wife of the king, the queen, was going to be coming to inquire about the welfare of their son. Abijah says, your son will die. Change and upheaval and difficulty Again, this could seem a little harsh at first, but on the other hand, isn't it astounding how many people have no room for God in their lives until they face a time of difficulty? They want God as though he were a genie so that they can rub the bottle and have God magically appear to perform their every wish. Your wish is my command. They basically seem to indicate this is what God must do. Some people do not want God and his rule, God and his commands, God and his word, but they want God to get them out of trouble. And that's exactly what is happening with Jeroboam and his wife in this chapter. We read about a king by the name of Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29, going on through the rest of the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings 22. When you stop and think about it, in the divided kingdom, in the northern kingdom, there were 20 kings, 20 kings, and not one of them is mentioned as being good or righteous in the sight of God. After all, it is God's evaluation that matters. It seems as if the northern kingdom lasted for some 209 years until 722 B.C. when the Assyrians would overrun them and take them captive. 
2 Kings chapter 17. And of 20 kings or co-regents, not one was good. Ahab was likely the worst of all 20 of them. Ahab we read about in 1 Kings chapter 18. And he is confronted by Elijah. Elijah who goes up against the priest of Baal and Ashtaroth. 300 plus priests and priestesses, and there's going to be a contest. There had been a famine in the chapter before, and in this chapter, chapter 18 of 1 Kings, there's going to be a fight, a conflict. When you look at Elijah as a prophet, he is an amazing man. He is a colorful character. He is the type of person that really arrests one's attention. In 1 Kings 18... He says in the contest, verse 21, If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Do not halt or linger between two opinions. Either one is so or the other is so. It is not a both and type of matter. It is either God is God or Baal is. Israel is had been trying to serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24, for much too long. There's an interesting passage in Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11. God says, In my anger I gave the people a king, and in my wrath I took them away. You read about the selfishness and the envy of a man like Ahab, in 1 Kings chapter 21, as he takes a vineyard that belongs to a good man, it seems, by the name of Naboth. And when we come to 1 Kings chapter 22, God sends a prophet by the name of Micaiah. And keep in mind how 1 and 2 Kings deal with the matter of the prophets and their ministry. And Micaiah says in 1 Kings 22 and verse 14, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says, that I must speak. What a powerful example. And people who would truly be preachers and teachers of God's word today must point us to the Bible often and well and must consider things in context and help people to see the great message of God as it relates to our soul's salvation. The Bible is all about the salvation of man to the glory of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even in First and Second Kings, there is a king. His name is God. You keep looking at First Kings chapter 22, and in this chapter we read of the death of Ahab, the wicked king. Just a few verses before in First Kings 22 and verse 28. He had been told by Micaiah the prophet, If you come back from this battle in peace, then the people will know that the Lord has not spoken by me. Ahab dies in 1 Kings 22. Now we come to the book of 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, there is so much to learn. We have the last days of the ministry of Elijah. In 2 Kings chapters 1 and 2. In 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 9 and following, Elisha asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And indeed he seems to have received it. If you look at the miracles that were done by the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha, Nearly twice as many miracles are recorded from Elisha by God's power than Elijah. Both great men of God, but the double portion simply means Elisha wanted to be the successor, the one who followed Elijah in the prophetic ministry to the people of God. And God blessed him with that. In 2 Kings chapter 5, there is the marvelous story of a man by the name of Naaman. Naaman suffered from leprosy. He had been told by the prophet to dip seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman was upset initially. There are other rivers that are far better, that are far grander, that are much closer. 
Here's the question that I have for you and one that religious people everywhere should consider. If Naaman had dipped seven times in some other river, would God have removed his leprosy? I think not. If he had gone to the Jordan River and dipped five times and stopped there, would God have removed the leprosy as the prophet said he would? I don't think so. How about six times? No. You see, there must be a diligent desire to comply with the will of God from the heart. Romans 6, verses 16 through 18, we are to be obedient from the heart to that form of doctrine that delivers us. We are only saved by having a faith that works through love. Galatians 5 and verse 6. James 2, 14 through 26. By the way, in every passage in the New Testament that speaks of baptism and salvation, Baptism comes before one is saved, not after. Look at Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. To have your sins washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16. To be saved, Mark 16, 16, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Baptism is the response of a believing, penitent heart to the will of God. And it's at that point the blood of Jesus washes away our sins. Colossians 2.12, Romans 6, verses 3-5. through 5. Just like Naaman, who had his leprosy taken care of by the power of God in complying with God's will in dipping seven times in the River Jordan, so we, through faith and repentance and baptism, can have our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Who can argue with that? As we keep on looking at 2 Kings, let's think for a moment about the death of Jezebel in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. A wicked woman, the wife of King Ahab, she meets her demise in that passage, and I encourage you to read it. As the chapters unfold in 2 Kings 17, the northern kingdom goes into captivity to Assyria in 722 B.C. approximately, and they never return. But if you look at 2 Kings, there are 25 chapters in the book. And the remaining chapters concern themselves with the southern kingdom, which had some 19 kings, eight or so, I guess we could say, were good men, and some were exceptional leaders. The southern kingdom lasted another 135 years until Babylon came along. And they went into captivity there. In 2 Kings 19 and verse 30, there's a passage that says, God wanted Judah to have root downward and bear fruit upward. God wants all nations and all leaders of the nations to have good solid roots in God and in His righteousness and to bear fruit upward. What a powerful message, even for leaders and for nations today.